And now we have the pleasure of hearing from two other amazing speakers and researchers and advocates and change makers. Um, you heard a little bit yesterday about the Ending Violence Association of Canada. And one of the speakers is Dr. Aaron Whitmore, um, who is the executive director of the Ending Violence Association of Canada, which is a national organization based in Ottawa that is focused on addressing and responding to all forms of gender-based violence, including sexual violence. Aaron has over a decade of experience working in a variety of community-based academic and government research and uh, policy analysis roles in a variety of gender-based and, and gender equality issues. Um, and as the co-chair of the Ending Violence Association of Canada, it gives me really amazing, profound pleasure uh, to introduce Aaron to you. Um, speaking with Aaron today is also another doctor, Annalise Trudell. Um, Annalise is a gender equality consultant and the manager of education, training and research at ANOVA, which is a women's shelter and sexual assault center in London, Ontario. She brings extensive analysis of the causes and the impacts of gender-based violence and of preventing prevention programming through her doctoral and postdoctoral research at Western University. As a manager at ANOVA for over a decade, Annalise has overseen the facilitation, curriculum development and evaluation of youth anti-violence programming and professional trainings. She is a seasoned public educator and facilitator with over 500 lectures and presentations engaging youth, professionals and post-secondary students through public education. They're here today to talk about an important piece of research which is timely and relevant um, called Pandemic Meets Pandemic, understanding the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence services across Canada. I can't think of another more important piece of research that could be presented today. And I can't think of two more uh, relevant, awesome people to be presenting this research because it is their research. So please help me welcome Annalise and Erin. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that introduction. Um, we're really happy to be here today to speak with everyone um, about our research. And I'm just going to get our PowerPoint um, up on the screen here. Great. Um, so today, Annalise and I are going to be speaking about a national survey that we conducted uh, to examine the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence service providers and uh, survivors. Um, the survey um, launched in May of 20, uh, 2020, so about two months into the pandemic. Um, and the goal of our survey, as I said, was to hear from service providers, both staff and volunteers, about the impacts that they were seeing the pandemic have on the services that they offered, um, the survivors that they were supporting on their own mental health and well-being, and what they were thinking about moving forward. Um, we left the survey open for about two months, and um, when we closed it, we'd heard from 376 staff and volunteers from across the country. Um, we heard from um, uh, GBV service providers in all of the provinces and territories, with the exception of Nunavut. Um, and we heard from a fairly even um, spread of people working in urban settings and rural and more remote and northern settings. We also asked people to tell us a little bit about the type of the organization that they were working for. And as you can see on the screen, um, about a quarter of our respondents were working in sexual assault centers and, and supports. 42% um, were working in uh, domestic violence shelters or transition houses. And then we also heard from about 33% of respondents who identified as working in some of the many other spaces that um, gender-based violence service provision is taking place. So we divided the report into what we found in terms of the impact on survivors of COVID-19 um, and then also the impact on staff and volunteers. So I'll start with survivors. 82% uh, of respondents described an increase in the prevalence and severity of violence. And I think at this point in the pandemic, we've had other research really validate that to be true um, and some research that's really representative uh, coming out of Stats Canada in particular. 
but that was some really early data that emerged that um, both sort of how much violence and how bad the violence was was increasing significantly. 20% notice changes in the tactics used to commit violence. Uh, so things like using isolation at home as a tool for engaging in violence, misusing information about the pandemic to exercise control. So saying things like, I'll bring it home if you don't do X, Y, Z. So I will bring the virus into our home in some way. Or that um, if she did particular actions out in her community, she would be at more greater risk and sort of misusing how that information was shared. And monitoring and controlling access to technology to increase that isolation and limit help seeking. And so as we all know, we've moved online pretty significantly. And so that actually enabled abusers um, to increase how they uh, control folks. 34% noticed changes in the mental health and well-being of survivors, including increased reports of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and self-harm. And I want to just note that sort of the baseline for survivors in terms of those um, indicators is usually pretty high compared to the general population. So to see a 34% increase is pretty significant. A couple quotes um, that were poignant for us. I have noticed that isolation during the pandemic has been a tipping point for some people, causing the abuse people experience to go from bad to worse, causing women and children to seek uh, immediate shelter from partners. There were many more cases of strangulation and serious physical assaults leading to a higher risk of lethality. And I've seen an increase in violence and the gravity to a level that I had never seen before. There were also changes in how survivors were utilizing uh, supports and systems. So this is separate from the violence they were experiencing, but how were they actually getting the supports they needed out of that? So some of the things that um, were highlighted were that there were fears about contracting COVID if they came into shelter or access service points. And so sort of minimizing um, or pulling back from getting the help that they needed or waiting until it got so, so bad that they really did need to wait and that waiting uh, presented an increased risk. Fears are unwillingness to follow COVID protocols that can be really triggering. So um, when you come into shelter, the need to perhaps quarantine at the outset and really not have a lot of engagement with other people and stay quite isolated to your room, the um, need to remain distance, that shelter staff often have to wear masks and shields. Um, those are all sort of reminiscent of the isolation that abusers would enact. Inability to participate in telephone or virtual supports because of technology access issues or lack of privacy in the home. So in some ways, technology in the report highlights this was beneficial. It increased access points for some folks who are, say, rural based um, and sort of not don't have access to transportation. But in a lot of other ways, it de decreased access to services. Um, a preoccupation with just meeting basic needs. Uh, so there's so many financial stressors that are affiliated with the pandemic um, or sort of schooling needs of children and their supports. And so those sort of took precedence over getting her needs met. A lack of availability of space. So in particular for many shelters, um, we've had to minimize how many folks we can bring in in order to support distancing, or we've had to use alternative housing approaches like hotels. And that really has meant that um, not only do we perhaps have fewer spaces, but there's also a backlog in getting into housing and social housing. And so the stay in the shelter is longer, which also backlogs getting into shelter and just prevented from seeking or accessing um, supports because of abusive partners. We've seen an increase in calls to our crisis line, but at the last minute survivors are changing their mind about accessing the transition house. I think there's a fear among survivors of living in this type of communal setting at the time. I also think it's a bit traumatizing for residents to be faced with strict isolation and PPE requirements. A strict regulation can often be part of the abuse they face and the reason they came to us in the first place. We have had to make several changes to residents' ability to sign out, isolation upon intake, communal space restrictions that I feel could trigger past abuse experiences and cause extreme harm to our clients. And so really the idea that, as we all well know, uh, healing requires connection and connection is really challenged by a lot of what COVID has brought to us. And so there's also the challenge of figuring out where am I safest? Am I safest in my home or am I safest in a shelter? And how are folks making those risk assessments in this context?
So the second part of our survey looked more specifically at the experiences that staff and volunteers were having doing this work on the front lines during the pandemic. Um, and probably not surprising to anybody listening today, um, the survey respondents indicated that this was a period of increased stress, exhaustion, and real kind of concern about what the future might hold for the organizations and the work that they were doing. Um, we heard that almost everyone found it necessary to make at least one significant change in the work that they were doing. Um, many um, experienced uh, concern about the health risks that they might be encountering doing this work, and 90% reported at least some negative impacts on their ability to do their, their work or volunteer duties. And so when we looked at the responses that we received from staff and volunteers, we had asked people to identify the role that they that they played in their organization. And, and we looked specifically at responses that we received from those in um, managerial or director type roles. Um, and uh, I think that the, the stories that we heard from people working in these positions were really compelling. And I'll just read the quotation, um, which came from a, a director of a shelter who, who sort of speaks to what this, what this experience has been like. And this person says, if I'm awake, I'm working. It doesn't feel like there's any downtime. On top of regular work, there is all these other changes we have to look at, implement, and ensure are being followed. An overwhelming amount of information is being thrown at us from the province, the federal government, our funders, the ministry, public health, and other sources as well. No vacation at all or any days off. Every day is a work day. Exhaustion. I work in an extremely supportive environment and have a supportive home life, yet this is the most stressed I've felt in, 20, in my 25-year career in the sector. And so I think you can, you can see by that it speaks to this um, overwhelming amount of work and the pressures that came with doing that work in this new environment and looking specifically at some of the new challenges that people in leadership positions were facing. Um, we heard that you know 90% of those were doing the work of kind of supporting staff in adapting to these new conditions, even though even as they were doing so themselves. People in these leadership positions were also often the ones who were trying to figure out what sort of policies and protocols needed to be put in place um, to address the concerns the pandemic were, was raising. Um, and 25% of our respondents indicated that they had to make difficult decisions related to resourcing and um, laying off or decreasing staff hours. And then when we looked at um, responses from people in, in other positions within organizations, uh, you know, we, at, we heard a lot of the same concerns around this, this sort of um, stressful environment and, and having so many things to do. 81% um, of our respondents related, uh, said that they experienced an increase in work-related stress um, as compared to before the pandemic. Um, and, and one of those main contributors was this sort of challenge of um, moving things to home or, or online. Um, I think that when we look at the factors, though, that staff and volunteers identified as contributing to that increase in work-related stress, um, we can also see how it, it how they really spoke to the commitment that those working in the gender-based violence sector have. Um, to ensuring that those who need support get that support, um, even during the pandemic. And so a lot of the other factors that were kind of contributing to some of the challenges workers were, were holding and carrying were about those who were using their services. So um, many noted their concerns about the impact that the pandemic was having on survivors um, and their experiences of violence. Um, and about the kind of uncertain future and potential long-term consequences the pandemic might have on the viability of their ability to offer services. And so one, one respondent, I think, kind of spoke to the way that all of, these, all of these concerns were intersecting by sort of saying, you know, which fire do I put out? And certainly, you know, many of the adaptations that those working in the gender based violence sector had to make, such as working from home, you know, working online, changing workplace protocols, those are things that many people needed to do outside of the gender based violence sector um, as well. But really, what really came through in um, what we were hearing from staff and volunteers was how these adaptations were particularly difficult and unique um, in the context of providing support for gender based violence. Um, so we, we heard from many um, 
people doing counseling work or crisis response um, to survivors of sexual violence and abuse and what it was like for them to be doing that work in their own home, um, potentially with their family in the next room. And, and the quotation we have here, I think really speaks to that. This person said, working for survivors of sexual abuse, you hear a lot of horrible stories every day. Since COVID hit, I had to invite these stories into my home. My entire living space has been slimed with stories of sexual violence, making it hard to leave work at work. I think about work more often now. I feel like I can't escape it. And then we have another quote here from a shelter worker who notes COVID-19 restrictions in shelter have meant adjusting our expectations of residents and asking any residents who are unable to follow these expectations to leave shelter. Asking women to leave shelter is our worst case scenario. She is already vulnerable. Making these decisions is mentally stressful. Now, despite um, the many challenges that uh, staff and volunteers noted, we also did hear um, about some of the amazing adaptations and creative solutions that people working in the sector were, were coming up with um, during the pandemic. Um, and so we've included a couple of quotations here. Um, the first, the first um, respondent here talked about how being a trauma-informed organization really um, created a, an environment where it was possible, as this person says, to um, be working in a, an in a workplace that was an anchor of safety, empowerment, collaboration, and trust, even as the pandemic provoked fear and created chaos. Um, the, we also heard about, um, you know, some of these, these really incredible feats that were accomplished and the last quotation there on the slide speaks to this where um, this person talked about how they'd moved 120 survivors from face to face counseling to distance counseling in the period of two weeks. So certainly this was also a time of, of really um, great um, creativity and resilience that we know GBV organizations um, are, are known for. So the final kind of section of our survey um, spoke to um, where people think we need to go. Um, what are some of the things that need to be put in place to address some of these concerns? And um, I think that the, the quote that we have here up on the slide really kind of sums up the general message that we heard in response to this question, where to now? Um, and that is that, um, that returning to normal is um, simply not uh, going to work uh, in these conditions. So this person says, I certainly think there will be issues in returning to normal and this shift will occur slowly. However, I think framing it as a return to normal is incredibly problematic because our normal before the pandemic was not serving women who experience violence well. I think we ought to look at this pandemic as a learning lesson in the bigger picture of gender-based violence. And so the res uh, respondents talked about some of the strategies that might need to be put in place to avoid simply returning to normal. And in particular, people noted the um, necessity of core funding of responses that speak to the um, need for intersectional services um, and response. The real need to commit to doing prevention work to stop um, gender-based violence from happening in the first place. And then also the opportunity for knowledge sharing, for um, organizations to come together to talk about all of the things that they've been learning about how to do this work during the pandemic. Um, and so it's great to be, to be here doing that type of, of knowledge sharing today in this conference. So that's, that's a very quick kind of overview of the report. Um, the report is full of many really compelling quotations and stories from the people who took time to fill out the survey. And we really appreciated that. And, and I would encourage everyone to, to take a look at that. Um, I'll just turn it over to Annalise to just make a few final comments. So definitely go to the website and have a look at the report. Um, and some of those recommendations that Erin has started to highlight. We also, as a follow-up to it, um, to build on some of the recommendations, we hosted a research spotlight on gender-based violence and COVID, um, which you can view. That brought together community and academic researchers that were looking at some of the impact um, at that nexus. And the other sort of connection to one of the recommendations that is coming out in April, May is this financial forecast tool that we're developing. 
in terms of addressing the need for increased uh, core funding that was already at sort of a deficit level prior to the pandemic, one of the tools that we're looking to share broadly within the sector is um, and it's sort of a financial literacy moment here, but it's an Excel and you can sort of plug in some numbers around how many survivors you serve in different areas, what your um, budget is for your organization. And then it will predict two and five years out if you don't get increases, how many fewer survivors you'll have to serve and how many staff you will have to lay off in order to achieve that. And so it's a forecasting tool to really um, make an advocacy case around some core funding. And lastly, we're looking to do a one year in follow up survey also in April and May, tapping into the same folks that were able to fill in this first one um, and kind of being able to compare, have some of your initial worries and what you were initially seeing in those first few months played out a year in. What are some new concerns within the sector um, and what do we need to be addressing here on in? So anticipate that coming your way. Well, I, for one, one of 500, here, I, I, I would like to extend my deep thanks uh, for the wherewithal the two of you had. This, this survey began in May, the pandemic began in March. Um, so you, you were on it in a way that I haven't seen anybody on the um, national scale survey uh, train the way that the two of you ha were, have been. And I can't tell you how excited I am about the financial forecast tool. It sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, and the one year uh, survey. Uh, I think that all of us have been talking uh, for quite some time about the fact that core funding is desperately needed in all the provinces and territories. And, and it's desperately um, not in existence in the way that it needs to be. And I wonder if I may just call upon you um, both uh, to just, uh, if I may just ask a question, the financial forecast tool, when will it be open? Who will it be distributed to? And when will it be finished? Because I think it has the potential to really bring forward on a national scale, um, a, bit, a bit better of an empirical picture of what, what is needed. So you're pointing to the original idea, which is actually to gather data across the country from all the organizations and present it. And then we realized some technical hiccups in order to achieve that. So we're going to first spread it um, that individual organizations can use it to forecast their own um, two to five year and make their own funding case. And then we're looking at ways to gather that data to your right, make a sector wide case around why this is necessary and that it's not an individual organization sort of bad luck, um, but that it is sector based. So you can anticipate it coming into your inboxes late April, early May, but then how to gather that data a few months in is kind of where we're still trying to get the technical element on. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I, I'm reflecting on just kind of like a moment in history. It used to be the days that there was a big divide between the world of academia and the world of advocates you know, on the ground. And it's so it's just so inspiring to see um, so many advocates becoming academics um, because you have the power and the skills to be able to tell the story and make the case that the advocates doing the frontline work with uh, with survivors cannot make. And so we need you. We honor you. We thank you uh, for being our voice um, and the and the, the train, if you will, um, to to lay out the empirical evidence of what is needed. So. Um, all my respect to you both, um, huge thanks. And uh, it's just been such a pleasure to just get a bit of a snapshot of what was this massive, big piece of national research. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tracy. It was a pleasure to be here and share this with everyone. Thank you very much. That was very gracious. So stay warm in Ontario. I think it's still winter there. Um, and I think it's still winter in many parts of British Columbia as well. And uh, please stay safe.